Good evening, everyone. Uh, big welcome to you. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute, and it's a delight to have two seconds to introduce this program, which is going to be so interesting and so much fun. I hope those of you that are joining us have had something to eat. Otherwise, you're going to be really hungry um, by the time you're um, watching this, uh, watching everything that we've got tonight. But so much is happening. So much is happening at China Institute. Um, I was back at the Institute today. We're gearing up to welcome people back for in-person programs. Of course, our programs have been like this on Zoom for the past too long a period of time. And we're going to be welcoming kids back to an immersion program for Chinese language in the kids' summer school starting after July 4th. And starting July 13th, we're going to be welcoming people back in person for hybrid programming. And hopefully we are, if everything stays according to schedule, back to normal after Labor Day or normal in person. Anyway, tonight, uh, one of the things we're so excited to be launching is a culinary center at, at, at China Institute. And this is something that is very near and dear to my own heart. Um, I actually was first introduced to China Institute as a small kid um, because my grandmother took Chinese cooking lessons at China Institute in the 1960s. And I was the beneficiary of that growing up. Fast forward, things have changed a lot, um, but food is very much something that's at the intersection that connects us at a human level. And that's something that's very important to us at China Institute. And as we try to help um, people have a deeper understanding into China and what's happening in China, I can't think of a better way to do that than through the eyes of a culinary tour that we're gonna have tonight in a discussion. So a big welcome, encourage all of you to check out our website, our upcoming events, our programs, our schools. Please support us by becoming a member. We depend on that as we work with our foundations and supporters to demonstrate um, the reach that we're having. But without further ado, let me hand this over to Dinda Elliott, who is the mastermind behind all of our public programs at China Institute to introduce this evening's program. Over to you, Dinda. Thanks, James. Uh, welcome everybody to our Food and Ideas Festival, which celebrates Chinese cuisine, as James was saying, uh, and takes a deep look at greater China through the prism of food. Uh, this evening, we're talking with some extremely talented chefs about the global influences on the food of their hometowns, Hong Kong and Taipei. Nowhere in the world of Chinese cuisine is the food more diverse, more touched by foreign and outside influences than in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Both places started with fairly straightforward monocultural, uh, monoculture local foods, but then they of course felt the colonial influences of Britain in Hong Kong and Japan and Taiwan. And even before that, Taiwan adopted some subtle Dutch influences in its food, which we'll hear about as the Dutch passed through uh, on their way to the Spice Islands and elsewhere. Um, the foods of Hong Kong and Taiwan have also incorporated, of course, influences, influences from all across mainland China, from Sichuan and Hunan, from Chaozhou to Shanghai and, and other parts all across China. So we thought it would be really fun to look at how all these influences have shaped the food scenes in Hong Kong and Taiwan, which as such well-known culinary melting pots are places where you can find some of the best Chinese food in the world. Um, and the perfect people to talk about this are Hong Kong born Lucas Sin and Taiwan born Eric Z. Lucas is known as Lucas Si in mainland China and Eric's Chinese name is Shi Guan. Um, and they are both passionate chefs and restaurateurs in New York. Lucas is the executive chef at Junza Kitchen and Eric is the co-owner of 886 Restaurant, which serves Taiwan cuisine. They are also great buddies and competitors of a sort, each insisting that his home cooking, hometown cooking, is better than the other. They created a super fun online series called the Shy Boys Club during COVID. And uh, so let's bring them on um, and, and get this conversation started. So Lucas and Eric, you wanna turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves. And um, let's jump into our conversation. Hey, welcome, welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. Good, Thank good you to, for having good, me here. 
Good to see you both. And I first have to say, Eric is, it looks like he's in a bunker because he is in the basement of his restaurant, 886, which he tells us is hopping tonight. A lot, very, very busy, yeah? Yeah, um, unfortunately, not every restaurateur in New York gets an office like Lucas. And so <laughs> I'm here with my laptop propped on top of a freezer and uh, a bunch of boxes behind me. It's the well, it's reality very, of New York and you either very, learn to love it or you hate your life. Very elegant. So um, anyway, thanks for being with us tonight. So let's, um, let's start with uh, the early days in both Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, and we've got some images that are gonna help, help us through this conversation, but you know, tell us what was, what was, let's start with Taiwan. I think our first, we can jump to our first slide. Um, I think that uh, actually the first one might be, might be Hong Kong. Let's see. Yep, it's Hong Kong. So Lucas, let's start with, uh, with Hong Kong. What was, what was food like in Hong Kong before all the outside influences started coming in? I guess the way to describe sort of indigenous or like natural called bunde or bendi, um, Hong Kong cooking would have been about Hong Kong as a fisherman's and fishing village. So a lot of um, very humble cooking, a lot of very simple cooking uh, based off of the resources of the land. Um, here we have a photo of uh, the sausage, but this, um, this sausage making technique is actually a very, very old one. Um, it dates back to um, the 500, uh, like 500 AD or so, when there was a first notation of stuffing sausages um, uh, stuffing small pork intestines with um, with pork, curing them, and then letting them hang dry so that they constrict and then preserving the flavor during a season for the rest of the year. Um, a lot of this sort of curing technique is carried on to the curing and the drying of fish and scallops. Um, a lot of these like basic um, techniques of preserving very humble origins is a huge part of Hong Kong cuisine today. Um, exo sauce, for example, is very much based on the flavor that you get from curing meats and curing ham, as well as curing things like scallops. So a lot of like fishermen, uh, old school technique um, uh, that eventually became a little bit more glamorous um, as time went on. But this is probably what a lot of basic uh, Hong Kong cooking looked like um, before uh, the British um, colonization. Interesting, interesting. And so, and Eric, here we've got sausage in Taiwan. So, but the sausage in Taiwan is, is different. It comes from, has different origins, right? Yeah, so if you look at just the photo itself, it kind of explains the, uh, um, the meaniness of it, meaniness of it. Yeah. Taiwan, Taiwanese probably, this is again, a very much a hypothesis, but uh, the Taiwanese is said to have gotten the sausage stuffing technique from the Spanish and the Dutch. Well, the Spanish colonized Northern Taiwan in around 1620s. And um, if you look at it, this is very different from the more fundamental Chinese style curing sausage. This is stuffed sausage and just hung dry for about a day. Um, so you can see that there's still a lot of moisture contained um, and like the Cantonese lap chang that we saw just now, where it's cured for literally up to weeks and with zero to no moisture at all. Uh, so yeah, that in itself is probably the most fundamental difference in terms of curing meat. Uh, in Taiwan, because of its um, geographic location being off well, the Strait of Mainland, uh, it, it was difficult for Hunan to really transfer their, their meat curing quote unquote techniques so and technology. First, back up for a second, because yeah. I didn't know this, that Hunan is known for its cured meats, right? Hunan really is probably, arguably the place in China that's curing the best meats, whether it be ham, um, sausages, or, um, you know, uh, different cuts of like even copa being cured nowadays. Um, and it's said to have originated in the, in the, farms of Hunan because it's, again it's inland people needed to find creative ways to preserve their protein uh, with limited resources and so today you go to China the best cured meats hands down whether smoked or unsmoked it's almost like Tennessee um, <laughs> but you're yeah. saying it's too far away so it, it just yeah and you yes were too far away and uh, yeah there was no you know the Chinese civil war hasn't broken out yet people haven't fled to Taiwan so we'll get to that later yeah, but in terms of more traditional and 
I mean, not really archaic, but the most OG Taiwanese cuisine. It's really from the, the Hokkien and the, uh, the Minnan people because uh, the, the first immigrants from mainland China is like during the Qing dynasty is from Fujian and a lot of um, Hokkien people in Fujian, which is why if we kind of uh, dissect Taiwanese food today, most of the, many of the core dishes have Fujianese roots, whether it be uh, a cured squid in a Hakka stir fry or um, the use of fermented black beans, which is also very Fujianese, and the use of rice wine uh, and the use of ginger, lots of Thai basil. Those are all aromatics and flavor profiles that Taiwanese food share with a Fujianese food. Wow. And when you say Fujianese food, are you really sort of mostly talking about Hakka cuisine? Uh, or it... Yes, mostly okay. Hakka. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so then let's jump into the colonial era, era because uh, lots happened to food in both of these places during the colonial era. So, so Lucas, I can see we're in Hong Kong here. So what the heck is this uh, banquet we're looking at? So this, this is a photo from Australia Dairy Company or Australia Milk Co Company in, um, in Jordan in Hong Kong. And this is maybe my favorite restaurant in the world. Um, oh, wow. This is... Uh, it, it's near and dear to my heart, and um, it's called Australia Dairy Company, but it's got nothing to do with Australia. Um, and this is a pretty typical type of cha chan tang. And so a cha chan tang is a Hong Kong style diner that really sort of blossomed, um, really blossomed after World War II, but um, began its like first footsteps um, during the um, British colonization. So if I can paint a picture for you, um, when the British occupied, uh, when the British moved into Hong Kong, um, uh, it wasn't as if like European influence was immediately luxurious and cool. Um, it took a little while and a lot of these, um, uh, uh, the aspirational aspect of European cooking started with these things called Bing Sat and Bing Sat are um, ice rooms or ice houses. Um, and these ice houses were basically cafes, um, uh, European style cafes, right? You know, you know, go in for tea and, and coffee and your tea would have milk in it and that sort of thing. And that really came about because of the import of ice into Hong Kong, um, which is also a funny story because in, in the beginning, most of the ice in the 1840s was from the United States and then eventually shifted to a, a English source and then eventually into a mainland Chinese source and in some time, I think it's like the 70s, when um, Hong Kong factories start to produce their own ice. And when they start to produce their own ice, there's a proliferation of these sort of cafes because people can start drinking cold drinks. Um, it's something that we take for granted, but that style of eating um, in the middle of the day, um, having tea um, with pastries and buns and stuff really started with these things up with these ice houses. Eventually, um, as these... Um, uh, sort of ice houses begin to develop, they become cha chan tangs, and cha chan tangs are literally uh, tea restaurants. Um, but they're also, um, they're hybrid sort of Chinese or Hong Kong style Western food. Um, they're walks at the back for stir fries for lunch, they're braises, they're pots for like braised meats for lunch, but they also serve breakfast. And the photo that you saw before would have been like macaroni um, in soup with ham, uh, scrambled eggs, uh, uh, um, thick cuts of toast, uh, milk tea, and coffee, and yunyang, which is half-half coffee and tea. Um, another oh, thing wait, to that. Wait, 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 wait. Pause yeah. for a second. You have to explain the coffee and tea thing because that is a crazy yeah. Hong, Kong, Hong Kong thing. Yeah, it's called yunyang, and um, yunyang is. Uh, uh, it's it's half half coffee and tea and the idea is that we brew our tea very 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 strong so you put milk into it um the tea itself is usually Ceylon black tea so it's very very oxidized and you might have seen some photos of people making this tea before in what's called a stocking um and there are these like long um uh, 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 what are they called the tea, tea bags and as you're pouring the tea into these pots you like lift that pot super super far up and you get incorporate as much oxygen as you can into into the tea brewing process so you get a really really strong tea that's very very aromatic um it's it's way stronger than uh, chinese tea um and people put evaporated milk into it um and evaporated milk because it's a shelf stable milk um just as is the case for many of the other ingredients in hong kong style western cooking or cha chan tang style cooking are made from affordable uh, shelf stable products. Um, uh, here the macaroni you'll see is made with cream of chicken 
um, and and not it's not like a you know chicken soup that they made that day, right? It's it's instant, um, and uh, the use of ketchup and spam is huge in Chao Tang as well. Um, and to paint a little bit more of a picture, when Chao Tang became sort of popular, um, an average Hong Kong person would maybe make fifteen Hong Kong dollars a month, but a meal at a proper Western restaurant would have been about ten dollars. So it was totally unaffordable. But yet there was this sort of like aspirational aspect to sort of um, Western style food. Um, and so Chao Tang kind of became the Hong Kong people's answer to that sort of that lifestyle while maintaining some degree of affordability. That is so fantastic. We have a couple more pictures. So let's take a look. There's another one, um, Aaron, if you'll advance to the next one. There you go. Uh, there's another delicious macaroni soup with ham on top and yeah butter and you'll see the french toast on the side is also one of my favorite dishes with a big pad of butter um actually it's not butter it's margarine um and uh the french toast is deep fried it's one of those things you know um hong kong people um find a more indulgent way to cook these sort of like breakfast staples so to speak and this has been this was probably um three days of the week growing up like i was eating this Right. And ketchup features large in these cha chan ting, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think the ketchup deserves more respect, Lucas? Yeah, I mean, I don't really understand the uh, hate for it. Um, uh, ketchup is wonderful because it's really quick access to huge amount, amounts of sugar when you're cooking. Um, so you can um, get really sort of nicely balanced sweet and sour sauces. Um, and also uh, ketchup caramelizes very nicely. So if you cook it in something like a wok, you can get really cool tomato sauces. And ketchup is a big part of Taiwanese cooking too. Right. Okay. So let's see. Do we? I'm not sure if the next. Okay. Then we got a final slide, and there's. I don't know if that's just coffee or if that's the coffee and tea mix. Yeah, that looks. That looks like um, it could be a yun yang, um, which is the half half coffee and tea. Uh huh. Okay. So and there's this. There's another famous cha chen ting, um, mm -hmm. which just kind of. It's. I love this picture because it does kind of capture the feeling of, you know, everyday Hong Kong. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's jump over to Taiwan, because in Taiwan, you had, of course, the Japanese um, colonization. So um, the Japanese, let's see, they came into Taiwan in 18, let's see, what was the date? Um, they came in 1895, after the Sino-Japanese War of 1894, and they stayed around for 50 years until 1945. So. Eric, you want to join us and tell us a little yeah. bit about the culinary, what kind of culinary influences did they leave behind? Yeah, um, I'm terrible with dates, but- uh, I have no I'm, idea. <laughs> <laughs> so before the Chinese, you know, before the Sino-Chinese War, Sino-Japanese, my bad. Uh, so unlike, in a little history, uh, unlike the British colony of Hong Kong, um, the Japanese wanted to make Taiwan kind of their the cream of the crop and like their shining example of what the great empire of Japan can do uh, for their colonized people. And so they really put in the effort to um, place in a very, uh, not labor intensive, but you know, agriculturally rich economy. And they put in railroads, the first railroads in Taiwan, and they set up capital in Tainan. So they ran it as if it was, it was you know, part of the mainland of Japan. Um, and and th therefore, the, cu the culinary influences really run deep. And it doesn't, it, I think what, what fascinates me the most about Lucas's example is that in, in Hong Kong, the, the, um, the income gap and the fact that people would have to spend a month of salary at a Western restaurant. But back then in Taiwan, people straight up just set up Japanese restaurants and had ch Japanese citizens um, kind of, marrying Taiwanese local citizens or marrying the Aborigines and, and, and the cuisine kind of started blended there. And what we can see even today is a bunch of Taiwanese style izakayas, right? This okay, alley so looks so like it's straight what, from explain Japan. What, what, explain what an izakaya is. So an izakaya is a place where you get small bites and drink lots of beer. Yeah. It's essentially a beer house, yakitori, deep fried stuff. Yeah. Um, nothing super substantial. It's traditionally somewhere where um, uh, Japanese salarymen would congregate after work with their bosses and just get obliterated and, uh, and head <laughs> home before doing the same thing the next day. And these still to this day lie in the streets of Taipei, right? Yeah, and you have, you have serious pockets of them too. Yeah. In Taipei, you have the uh, uh, Mingsheng Donglu, which is 
known for their izakayas, right? And in uh, that was and still is kind of a heavily Japanese district. But even outside of Ming Sendonglu, you get these pockets of Japanese restaurants that resemble everything you see here and everything that represents uh, an izakaya beer and small bites. But the bites part has kind of deviated from the traditional yakitori, the karage, um, the small bowls of rice. Instead, it's being replaced by kind of a fusion style of cuisine that's certainly rooted in, in Japanese cuisine in terms of its form factor, but the flavors have largely become very, very Taiwanese. For example, like, uh, like a chicken yakitori. Now, almost every Taiwanese zakaya serves the chicken yakitori, but the glazing is different. It's not a very traditional Japanese glaze. You get five spice, you know, soy sauce glaze that is pretty uniquely in a Taiwanese signature. And um, the karage is not traditional like the Japanese style where you dip the mayo and it's like a sweet, uh, it's a potato starch batter, um, a potato starch, wet potato starch batter. In Taiwan, you would see izakayas that serve popcorn chicken that essentially looks like a karage, but it's, you know, battered in dry sweet potato starch. Yo, so wait very, very what is so what is popcorn chicken tell us about that again popcorn chicken is one of the signature street foods in taiwan where you take it originated from this is another interesting story taiwanese people and i feel like asian people in general prefer dark meat over white yeah. so it's the it's, it's the reverse from the states so in taiwan i, I believe in the the 50s in ximanding in Taipei, uh, this guy wanted to figure out how to sell his breast meat, you know, his chicken breasts. So he mm -hmm. cut it up into medium sized pieces, battered them in sweet potato starch, deep fried, and then uh, dusted it with white pepper, salt, sugar, MSG, and a bunch of fried basil to garnish and put them in little bags and people walked around and just chowing on them. It's a perfect form factor because the cook time is relatively short. So you wouldn't dry out the chicken breast. Uh -huh. um, that was the, the biggest turnoff for people is that chicken breast is a lot drier. It's, it's got less fat content. And right. so cutting it into like inch size cubes, it really only, you, you need to fry for like 30 seconds to 40 seconds. And that keeps the juiciness within the meat. Right. And so, but the form factor is very similar to the Japanese karage, which is fried thigh meat. Um, which brings us back to the izakayas. But instead of the karage, you get, you know, Taiwanese popcorn chicken. But the entire dining experience is as if you're in an izakaya. Yeah. It's so interesting what you said about the sort of um, the extent to which the Japanese really sort of, um, uh, there was so much mixing between the Japanese and the Taiwan people in Taiwan and the culture was very much, I mean, I remember when I was studying there as a student in the late 70s, lots of the Taiwanese spoke Japanese still, um, you know, the older people, and they still felt quite reminiscent of, of that period of time. But, but so let's look at the next slide, um, because this is, okay, so this is a Taiwan oyster omelet, right? Um, but is there yes. some kind of Japanese influence there too, or? Yes, what, so this is, this dish kind of, if we, if we look into it and examine it, the, you can't really see in this photo, but there's a pool of caramelized potato starch, sweet potato starch on the bottom that is kind of the, the constructional base of this entire dish. Uh, that sweet potato starch is done in a very Fujian style, um, uh, Fujianese style uh, omelet. So the Fujianese people have an oyster omelet because they're also right by the ocean and easily accessible for these, you know, plump oysters. Um, a good example would be Malaysia. Also, a lot of Fujianese people and Hakka people, they also have their own oyster omelet. Mm -hmm. What is not Fujianese about this dish is the sauce. So the mm -hmm. sauce in, in Taiwan, we call it a different, a few different names, a tian la jiang, which means sweet and spicy, or a hai shen jiang, hai shan jiang. Um, hai shan, I don't know exactly why it's called that, but the basic, uh, ingredients and the components of it, the flavor profile doesn't really change. It's sweet from ketchup. We got it from the Americans. Uh, and it's uh, a little spicy from hot sauce. And uh, it has the earth, not earthiness, but it has a very solid core flavor that is not funky, but it just keeps everything intact. And that is miso. A lot of people don't know, but miso plays a pretty big role in 
a lot of the the local Taiwanese sauces, and wow. it, it, it's course, mostly it's, hidden. Which is, and that's a Japanese influence, right? Yeah, uniquely like Japanese. Uniquely Japanese. Nobody else does it. So. Right. So I want you and Lucas to help solve a mystery for me. Okay. Um, you guys, you just said that ketchup comes from America. Okay. So, but in Mandarin, xiezhi, right, is tomato juice or tomato sauce. And isn't it in Cantonese? Don't you say ketchup? Isn't that, isn't that ketchup? Yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, it Cantonese? Um, so it, it started from Mingnan Yu, which is yeah. Fujianese. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Which is adjacent, it's very similar to Cantonese. And so ketchup, ketchup is, um, sounds a lot like ketchup, but I have to say, and I'm not the person to, 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 to uh, I, I'm not the person with the final word, but I met some, a PhD student who's writing her book on, um, her thesis and her book on ketchup, and it <laughs> seems to be the case within ketchup academics that the story that ketchup comes from China is kind of a misnomer, it's kind of a red herring. Um, it sounds very similar, but uh, it could have been um, the Chinese name came was applied to the ketchup thing after the fact, um, and some people trace it to the Romans. Study, but and then let me just ask you: so the field of ketchup studies is that a very long? Yeah, uh, it's, people are ridiculously um, well versed in the history of ketchup, and I've heard solid arguments that I can no longer recall about um, ketchup not actually having any relationship to any sort of like any ah. thing. I mean, for one, we know that um, uh, the, the claim that ketchup came from China can't truly be correct because tomatoes didn't get to any sort of Chinese cooking until very, very late. It's a new world vegetable. Oh, um, damn. Right, yeah. Um, oh, so, disappointing. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that's um, that we're going to now move on to uh, post-1949, where, okay, here you go. So, you know, 1949 happens tons of mainlanders come to Taiwan. And of course, Yang Kai-shek and his wife, you know, they build this great grand palace hotel and this sort of embodies that, you know, um, the influence of the mainlanders in Taiwan. Uh, but then it, it very much influenced um, Taiwan food, right? I mean, I remember again, when I was a student in the late seventies, you know, that at that time, really, you could get the best Chinese food in the world in Taiwan because all the great chefs had fled from the mainland. And so you had just, you know, the great food from every single province of mainland China. But so, so Eric, talk a little bit about what the mainlanders brought to Taiwan with them in terms of food. Yeah. So again, a little backstory, of course, the KMT, they're known as the bourgeois, right? Um, they didn't have the numbers, but they had all the money, supposedly and allegedly, all the <laughs> the spoiled generals with their fancy food. Yes. Um, but they all fled to Taiwan after the war, and therefore all the good food, the private chefs, the banquet chefs, their, all the restaurant owners, all fled to Taiwan with the KMT. And and so, as you said, you know, most of these regional cookings, at least the cream of the crop, all went to Taiwan. And mm -hmm. and even today, you can see. I think the prime example would be Din Tai Fong, right? It's Shanghainese food. Oh my gosh. It's yeah. Shanghainese food done to near perfection. Uh, so explain, what, in Taiwan. explain what Din Tai Fong is because lots of people probably don't know in our audience. Uh, Din Tai Fong is famous because they uh, kind of, um, they're the shining example of soup dumplings and they're credited to be the establishment that uh, kind of initiated this soup dumpling craze we're in the middle of. Uh, uh -huh. they're, they, uh, their gold standard is uh, the 18 folds. Every single one of their soup dumplings has only 18 oh. folds. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And so they're very meticulous about their recipes. And uh, yeah. And uh, they are Shanghainese, but they started in Taiwan, right? From Shanghainese immigrants. Uh, actually, Hangzhou, because they, they, their last right. name is Yang. Interesting, interesting. Um, and huh. so that's the, that's the prime example. Right. And uh, if we could look at the next slide, you also had the beginning of real bank. Well, first, you got to tell this story. This is the. Oh, yeah. Right. So this is the kind of the mother box of Taiwanese beef noodle soup. Uh, this is a pijian douban, which is a fermented fava bean paste. Think of it almost like a miso, but made from fava beans. And uh, the Sichuan, it, it's from Sichuan. It's from pijian, the first two characters, which is a province, not a province. It's a, 
It's a kind of like a small town in Sichuan that is famous for producing this dobanja. And by the uh, way, Eric, I'll tell you that we did a program last week, just last week, where we talked about, we sort of visited, uh, you know, through images, Dobanjiang factories in PCN. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, this is, I have an uncle who owns a bunch of restaurants in Chengdu, and he told me Juncheng Pai, which is this one, is the best. You can find it in, in New York City Chinatowns, but I, I, uh, I, I kind of think they don't taste the same. <laughs> you know, maybe they export the, the crappier stuff. But how did this stuff, how did this stuff get to Taiwan? Uh, again, uh, the bourgeois moved to Taiwan and uh, Sichuan being, you know, one of the, the, the bases, military bases, a lot of the generals were there. And so they, when they moved to Taiwan, one of them, this, as the legend goes, these things aren't super well documented, <laughs> uh -huh. but uh, as legends go, this general was so homesick that he made a beef stew uh, out of this dobanjiang and then start taste it so good, give it to all his friends and start selling it as New Romian, which is beef noodle soup. Uh, and a little backstory is that Taiwan wasn't a large beef consuming economy back then. It wasn't until you know, the Japanese emperor wanted to, no pun intended, beef up his soldiers for the, uh, the war, World War II, did um, he kind of put down his foot and be like, everybody eat beef now. Wow. And, yeah, and so I think perfect timing. If if this general arrived a few years earlier, not that not that it would make sense, but if the idea came a few years earlier, we, we might have, have missed. Your own yen. Yeah. I mean, right. um, wow. All right. So next slide, we've got we also have the beginning of real banquets. The mainlanders brought banquets both to Taiwan and to Hong Kong, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I mean when we're talking about banquet style cooking in Hong Kong, um, you can think of uh, the influences in a lot of Hong Kong cooking uh, was also, you know, after the Civil War. Um, after the Civil War, um, uh, people are going, a lot of chefs are going to Hong Kong who had spent their sort of best years in Canton, which for a very long time until basically 37 and World War II was like the culinary capital of southern China. Uh -huh. So a lot of chefs were getting like hardcore Cantonese, Cantonese training and Cantonese cooking is known for um, technique and like celebrating bountiful ingredients and knife technique and walk technique and that sort of thing. And so most of what people in uh, my generation and in my parents' generation think of as Hong Kong style Cantonese cooking is really sort of a Canton or Guangzhou or Guangzhou style Cantonese cooking. And so a lot of that technique trickled down to Hong Kong after the Civil War and these banquets were met with the sort of nouveau rich um, uh, 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 society of Hong Kong, right? Plus the foreign influence. So you have all these like weirdo banquet dishes that we can talk about a little later, but in a similar um, in a similar sort of like trajectory to what was happening in Taiwan, you have the meeting of like highly skilled chefs who have a political reason to be in Hong Kong, plus people who are rich and excited to celebrate sort of um, ingredient, specific ingredients and specific tastes and, and flavors. Amazing, amazing. So actually very similar in a sense uh, in the mainland and, and in, uh, sorry, yeah. in, and both yeah. Taiwan and Hong Kong, similar. And, and the Shanghainese influence thing too, because a lot of the big hotels like the Peninsula and a lot of those restaurants in that area um, that had opened in Hong Kong that are a big part of like the daily um, Hong Kong life now were, were Shanghainese restaurants um, okay. uh, like sticky rice um, and um, chow nian gao and, and, and soup dumplings and uh, sheng jian bao and that sort of thing is, is very big on in the streets of Hong Kong. I had to include this photograph because this is from the film of course Eat Drink Man Woman the great Ang Lee film and uh, this is, you know, this is the the guy in the center, of course, is the mm -hmm. father. He's a wonderful, wonderful yeah. chef. So here's his his uh, banquet, and it's um, very much speaks to that era, I think. Um, so I also want to just let let people know that we will take some questions at the end. So in a few minutes, yeah, a few minutes. Um, if you can type your questions into the, you'll see the Q and A uh, icon at the bottom. So type your questions in, and I'll try to get to them. Uh, in a few minutes, but um, yeah, so let's let's um, move on. Let's see, there are a couple more slides of, of banquet and then keep going because we're going to get to one of the, this is a very special dish that Lucas was just talking about, the Hong Kong special dish. Yeah, so this is the top part of um, Long Ha Yi Min, which is um, 
uh, yi noodles with um, lobster, but it, the sauce is cheese. So a lot of um, the Cantonese banquets that I grew up with have these like super odd um, uh, uh, fusion-y sort of clashing um, uh, 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 dishes. Um, this is one of those dishes that's, uh, it's, so it's stir-fried lobster as you would for like ginger scallion lobster or something, and then steep fried. And then it would be um, uh, uh, tossed in a cheese sauce and served over Chinese style noodles, um, which is bizarre. Um, another thing I grew up with was like fruit salad that was tossed in mayonnaise that was also like in the beginning of very many banquets. Um, and like these, this is, I mean, that I mean, this is like prime 1960s, 1970s, like the mash of this like Cantonese style cooking with this like fascination with foreign food. Um, right. A lot of Hong Kong sort of like trends, but also ingredients were imported um, from places like Australia, um, uh, sashimi from Japan, um, uh, even shark fin really sort of like took off. And those sort of trends for um, delicacies, so to speak, um, uh, and, and mashup flavors of like fusion -y type of cooking with Cantonese style banquets really became a thing um, in the 1960s and 70s. And, and for that reason, it probably wouldn't have taken place anywhere else, but those dishes very much exist in, in uh, Hong Kong style cooking today. What are your, both of you, you, um, you know, if you could speak to this, what are your favorite sort of mashup dishes, you know, that are uh, like a Hong Kong dish that's a mashup of, of various other cultures yeah. or a Taiwan dish that, that's a mashup? What are your um, favorites? In the um, Aaron, you want to bring both of them onto the screen so we can all talk together? Oh, if it's yeah. possible. Sorry about that. There no we go. Problem. And we still have more slides though, um, but I just wanted to bring both of them on the screen, but go ahead. Uh, I can't see the screen for some reason. Well, we, the... we can see you, Eric, we can see oh, you. Is it, okay, I see it yeah. now, okay. What's, yes. your, what's your favorite, uh, you know, your favorite mashup? So this is actually something that is super, relatively new. I tried, I made it here in the States. I've never had it in Taiwan yet. Uh, okay. it's what is it certainly a mashup it's a taro toast so it's, ta it's shokupan which is japanese milk bread and uh, taro puree which is like a think super 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 creamy mashed potato but sweet and with taro instead okay. and the pork floss so okay wait, signature wait, can, we, can we just, just slow you down for a second so you said it's japan it's what's the white stuff Shokupan. It's a Japanese milk bread. Milk bread. Yes. So this is kind of like a toast, but a, a okay. lot fluffier, lighter. Okay. Um, All right. And then you got the taro. So the taro is the creamy stuff, and then you've got pork floss. Yeah. yeah. Right. The Taiwan, Taiwanese love a sweet and savory dessert that's meaty. Um, so is this a dessert, or is this a sort of an, a main course type of thing? This is a snack. Snack. <laughs> Okay. Yes. And is this actually something like if I go to a restaurant in Taiwan, I can find this there? Um, so I, I can't speak for restaurants, but I know that it's popping up everywhere on the streets and more casual yeah, yeah. grab and go places. Um, that's how tend to be how things go, right? You have pop ups slash fast casual introducing a new item and then starts to pick up and then restaurants take the dish a little more seriously and starts carrying uh -huh. it at their own restaurants. Um, uh -huh. But and this in itself, yeah. yeah. And are you serving this at your restaurant? I know you've got popcorn chicken, right? Have you got we this? Don't have, we don't have this quite yet, um, but it, because our kitchen is so small. Okay. Uh, hopefully in Greenpoint, which is our next place opening up, oh. we'll be able to get this guy over. Um, it's, I, I made it at home once and it's, it's very, very good. You wow. don't expect such great flavors to, 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 to blend seamlessly. Amazing. And uh, Lucas, what's your favorite mashup? Um, I don't think we have a photo for it, but um, in, in Cha Cha Tang, there's a category of baked rice um, okay. or baked goods. Um, so you will have a heavy ceramic dish and then on the bottom will either be spaghetti um, or um, usually golden sort of egg fried rice. And over the top, there would be something like pork chops or fish fillet or chicken chops. And on top, there would be a sort of tomato-y based um, uh, uh, ketchup sauce with onions, fresh tomatoes, and a lot of ketchup. Um, it's a gokju baban, it's like the baked pork chop rice. Um, but there's also really interesting sort of like 
Macanese, Macanese adjacent um, version that's called Portuguese chicken rice that I really, really like. Um, okay. It's popular enough that you can get it in, in KFCs, but it's stir fried rice on the bottom. And then um, yeah, this, this dish called Portuguese chicken, which hardly has any real sort of Portuguese, um, uh, real relationship to Portugal other than Macau being a Portuguese sort of uh, colony. And it's right. kind of a like coconut creamy, um, with a little bit of curry and turmeric um, uh, uh, white sauce um, with, um, with, with big roasted chunks of chicken. It's really delicious. Mm -hmm. So this is a photograph, which I think is not actually what we were hoping to find, but it, but it speaks to, I think you were both going to talk about in the modern era, some mm -hmm. of the sort of experimentation that's going on. Yeah. So I think it's important to think, of, I mean, if the, the, the hypothesis was originally that if both Hong Kong and Taiwan were set up for fusion and they were set up for global influences and influences from different regions in China, then that sort of would continue to propel how the cuisine develops today. Um, and so in Cha Chan Teng, which is a very sort of popular place for people to eat on a daily basis, um, you yeah. see these restaurants, um, these Hong Kong style diners, continuing to absorb influence from places like Japan and Korea, depending on what the Sort of trends of the moment are. Um, mm -hmm. You see like those tornado, those Korean tornado omelets um, or Japanese omurice um, or like ja Japanese unagi uh, fried rice being a big part of like the regular lunch rota rotation in Hong Kong. Um, and it's something wonderful because it means that the kitchen, the business and the menu are all set up to absorb these influences um, even as they're cooking um, and, and like, you know, British culture isn't the trend anymore. So that's, let's take a look at a couple more images and then I'm going to take some questions from the audience. So this is, now we're moving into really the sort of exciting stuff that you're seeing going on in Hong Kong and Taiwan today. So what, what's this? Who is this? Um, uh, I just want to shout out um, like incredibly talented chefs that are much more talented than Eric and myself um, and much more successful and, ridic and doing ridiculously good things. Um, this is um, one of my friends, uh, Mei Chow, who was the best female chef in Asia, I believe two, three years ago. Um, wow. And her first restaurant was Little Bao. Uh, her second restaurant is Happy Paradise. Um, and she went to school and Boston University, but went back to Hong Kong to open um, uh, a Bao restaurant and eventually a very, very cool modern style Hong Kong diner in Cha Tan Teng. And happy paradise ridiculously beautiful neon um uh, cocktail program and like really inventive cooking a lot of like vegan cooking but just like the proof that chan chan tangs in any form that they take at any price point um are all about absorbing global influences ah, so what's what would be the kind of thing that or the kind of experimentation that makes her food special yeah one of the dishes that was really blew my mind was her take on the chung fun. So chung fun is um, some people call it a rice crepe or a rice roll. So it's a originally a chiu chow style technique. But what you take is you take rice and you grind it up into a flour and you add water to it into a batter and you steam it until it's very very thin. Right. This is what you get at dim sum restaurants. Slippery, like slippery, our, our slippery rice yeah. noodle kind slippery of thing. Slippery rice noodles. Yeah, a lot of people call it that. And yeah. so she makes one with. Um, uh, rice starch and scallops. So uh, instead of just using dried scallops to um, texture the noodle and, and give it um, a flavor, she take, makes scallop into a scallop puree and uses the proteins that are in the scallop to form the sheet of the rice roll itself. Um, so that when she presents it to you, it's just like rolls that look like rice rolls, but they're actually just made of 100% scallop. Fabulous. Okay, let's look at the next image. Who are these cool guys? So this is, uh, the guy on the right is Richie Lin. Crazy enough, he opened up a Taiwanese inspired restaurant, a fine dining restaurant in Taipei. And um, he is from Hong Kong. Okay. So like the best chefs. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, because Richie our culture is more compelling, you know. Um, <laughs> so what's special about what he's cooking or what he's doing? So everything they serve at Mume is kind of a play on in, a pre-existing Taiwanese dish. And it may or, not, may or may not be something that's on the international radar, but I think because Richie fell in love with Taiwan and um, he started creating these dishes that are an homage to the local thing, local, uh, local star dishes, which is something pretty ambitious. You know, it's, it's almost like the equivalent of uh, Manetta Tavern taking a simple burger and creating the Black Label burger that is five times the price Right. Uh, but some would argue is just a fancy burger. Right? Wow. Uh, my okay. favorite dish of his is the uh, the milkfish, 
So in Tainan, milk fish is considered the fish of Tainan, or even the fish of Taiwan. Um, it has a, it, it's crazy difficult to debone because it's got an insane amount of bones to flesh ratio. Uh, but he, like true Richie Lin, he debones it, serves it as a filet with an algae sauce that's made of abalone as well. And it just, it's plated so gorgeously. Uh, yeah. It, it, wow. It, wow. So this is a high end restaurant. It's expensive. This is, it is pretty expensive uh, for Taiwanese earning standard, but it's not something that's so crazy. Nothing like that one whole month of salary kind of, kind of crazy talk. Right, um, right. Yeah. And he's located in a very humble district, albeit uh -huh. a pretty rich district. Um, he's gone Michelin stars ever since he opened, and uh, I believe wow. he's at two right now. The restaurant is called Mume. Yeah, M-U-M-E. -E. They're doing really exciting things, and Richie's gone on to open a few Thai restaurants with a few uh, um, um, Thai partners in Taiwan, and uh, crazy successful mm -hmm. with an intensely uh, ambitious mind for, for cuisine. And it's, it's just exciting to wow. see how it can go ahead, you know? Okay, so who's this guy? This is uh, Vicky Cheng, and he's a chef of Via and recently opened Wing in Hong Kong. He is ridiculously talented, and he um, is a child of what was called like the private kitchen scene in Hong Kong. Um, in Hong Kong, the rents are super oh, yeah. high. So nobody's opening restaurants on the ground floor, um, and a lot of talented chefs are opening um, restaurants in buildings that are supposed to be apartment buildings. And he started in one of these spaces um, and eventually developed um, a, a keen sense for what he calls French Chinese food um, because he's classically trained in French cooking. Um, uh, so he uh, opened Via, that was a French Chinese restaurant, and recently um, has a rev had the revelation to open a Chinese Chinese restaurant that is built like a Chinese restaurant. Um, and by that, wow. I mean that the back of house in the kitchen isn't set up like a European style kitchen, uh, as many fine dining fancy places are, but this is set up like a Chinese kitchen, even though it's run by a classically uh, um, right. French trained chef. So the first um, one is called VIA, V-I-A? No, uh, V-E-A. V-E-A. And, and Wing second. is the second yeah. restaurant, W-I-N-G. Got it. Let's take a couple of questions from the audience. Firstly, I'll say somebody typed a uh, fabulous lesson on Chinese food history. Thank you so much to the two chefs for sharing your keen knowledge and passion for keeping Hong Kong and Taiwan cooking style and history alive and relevant. So that's generally the tenor of the comments we're getting. Um, this has been so wonderful, but there is someone who's asking, is there an interest in farm to table, nose to tail, free range, organic, et cetera, foods? And if yes, how is it influencing restaurants and menu, menus? So that's for both of you guys. Um, I worked at a restaurant in Hong Kong um, that was called Nur. Um, that was very much kind of a Noma ripoff type of restaurant um, that was very keen on um, Hong Kong farm to table. Um, almost everything we used was um, grown in Hong Kong. Um, but a lot of chefs had a lot of challenges doing that because um, Hong Kong doesn't have that much farmland. Um, mm -hmm. And even then the seasons are really kind of screwed up. So it'd be like March and we'd get like fresh tomatoes. Um, and, so, and so, you know, it's, uh, and, and of course, like it's much from an economic standpoint, it's much, much cheaper to get your uh, ingredients from mainland that has sort of like a larger scale operations. But there is certainly an interest and, and there's a growing interest in, in that type of cooking as well as um, vegan and vegetarian cooking. Uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is um, a brand called Omni Pork that is um, a Hong Kong based take on, it's very similar to Impossible Meat, but they make like vegan spam um, and it tastes delicious. It's ridiculous. Um, I wish I was, <laughs> I wish I didn't believe in it. To replicate spam is pretty fascinating. Yeah, to me. yeah, um, and so yeah, there is, and a lot of it is rooted in you know many. The number one religion in Hong Kong still is Buddhism, so a lot of people um, abstain from yeah. meat. So, so it kind of makes sense um, from that sort of uh, religious and, and lifestyle sort of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Taiwan, actually, funny you should mention nose to tail dining is something that we've embraced since day one. I believe so. Unlike Hong Kong, Taiwan has an, an <laughs> abundance of farmland. Uh, Taipei is pretty much the only extremely met metropolitan city. And so, and, and Taiwan is just, I don't, I don't know, it's, Taiwan is just almost littered with resources. You know, it's a oxymoron, but so 
even though with the fresh and, and abundance of resources, Taiwan doesn't export any protein. And therefore, all the protein slaughtered is almost consumed day of within the island. And so everything you get is going to be super, super fresh. And, and there's this thing called um, wen ti niu, wen ti zhu, which means room temperature. It just means it's, it's pre rigor mortis beef. Uh, the, the cattle or the pork was literally slaughtered morning of from the slaughterhouse. And then sometimes they skip the middleman and then deliver straight to the restaurants. Uh, wow. And, and when you have this kind of quality, uh, organ meat becomes extremely, extremely delicious. And because it's not been sitting in the refrigerator for two weeks. Um, and so there's really no off taste or gaminess to it. What you're getting is just a pure texture of, you know, these, these different parts of the animal that in, in the West is largely thrown out really. And so because of that freshness, nose to tail dining has seen just tremendous success in Taiwan. Um, mm. People who can't really afford to eat the prime cuts of the pig eat, you know, the hearts, the tongue, uh, you know, the inside of the cheeks, uh, the brain is used for soup. And it, it's just really going the extra mile and extra extent. And sometimes the nose, which is, uh, you know, um, collagen and gelatin rich is thrown into the roll fan to, to give the sauce an extra good consistency. And obviously pig ear intestine is, is all parts of the pig that is used to a, a, a tremendous extent. And uh, not to mention agriculture in Taiwan is, is, is crazy. I think, I think Taiwan only exports fruits, but in terms of vegetables, it's still within the island and consumed within the island. Um, so yeah, so it it's, sounds it's, it's like a pretty large part. Sorry, but it sounds like Taiwan, in terms of nose to tail, Taiwan beats, uh, beats Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong is a city <laughs> and Taiwan is a, Freaking island. Okay, fair so. enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so there is a Jennifer Gao wants to know from you, Eric, can you talk about the Dutch influence in Taiwanese cuisine, especially in Tainan? Is there any Dutch influence? I don't know. I don't actually exactly know the Dutch influence in Tainan. I do know the Dutch has had the influence on the sausage making that we right. had right. we had um, mentioned, but I don't in tempura, right? Tempura is Japanese. But the tempura sort of mistranslation is adjacent, I guess. Well, you know, a temp so tempura, to, for some context, tempura is a Taiwanese dish that is basically fried fish paste, and it's wow. dipped in the aforementioned sweet and sour sauce. Uh -huh. Sweet, not spicy, sweet and not spicy sauce. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, the, the name is derived from the Japanese frying method tempura right sure. but Which itself it has nothing is, uh, to do with tempura but it's called tambula tambula yeah, yeah. Tem oh tambula <laughs> okay tambula. Tambula. And, and then the, the right. interesting so it thing means is, sweet not spicy got it yes right. got, got it, got it got and the got japanese it. Okay. technique for cooking tempura is a dutch technique yeah but uh -huh. oh wow that's taiwanese, taiwanese okay. got it from the japanese for right. sure Okay, so somebody else is asking, they, they noticed that there was a curry dish in one of the banquets. Was curry an original Chinese dish? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, no, no, no curry no. is a myth. First of all, curry is kind of a way too broad of a term for what curry actually is. Um, right. But uh, curry uh, in the Chinese sense is very, is most similar probably to a, like a madras curry. Um, so a lot of turmeric, but also the addition of things like five spice and soy sauce, which is very Cantonese and Chinese. Um, there's a, there are a couple clues to how, there's no definitive answer, I think, but the, there are a couple clues to how curry became a huge part of Cantonese cooking um, or Southern Chinese cooking. One is um, the British, the Brits who also uh, colonized India, right? So that's a connection through trade routes. Um, there is a possibility of the proximity of India to Southern China, but that's actually generally quite far and India is closer to, to a, parts of like Western China. Um, the other interesting thing is actually many people, many of the original immigrants to Southeast Asian countries um, that have adopted things like curry are from the same regions that uh, uh, are from the same regions of people that ended up in Hong Kong first, right? So Hakka, Chiuzhou, Fujian, like a lot, all these sort of like groups of Southern Chinese people that were doing most of the initial emigrating um, would have taken up a lot of sort of like curry 
um, uh, uh, curry flavor profiles in places that would have it at hand, like in Malaysia, uh, in Singapore, uh, in, in Thailand, and places like that. Um, and so there's very a very good chance, and there was sort of like a backwards trend of curry making it into Hong Kong cuisine too. But Hong Kong style curry, which is mostly what people think of as Chinese curry nowadays, is as I said, like a ter mostly turmeric. Um, based Madras style curry that's not that spicy um, and often served with uh, pork chops and chicken for whatever reason. Okay, two final questions. Um, Taiwan's former name, Formosa, English name, Formosa, implies Portuguese influence. Is there Portuguese influence in Taiwanese cuisine? Um, yes, so the Portuguese were actually the first to reach the island of Taiwan in I think 1540s. Okay. Again, I'm not great with dates, All right. uh, but a quick Google search will, will, will get yeah, you there. Yeah. But as far as I know, they, they never colonized Taiwan okay. and um, they pretty much just gave Taiwan the name Formosa that was adapted by yeah. the Dutch and the, and the yeah. Spanish. Any influence? So no influence on the food? Nothing that at least I know of. You know, I'm sure okay. there's some smart, small part that maybe even kind of evolved throughout the years to, to something we see modern in, in modern day today, but right. nothing that really screams at it. All right, so final question. Who really started bubble tea? Oh, it's Taiwan. There's, Taiwan, just, there's sure. no question. There's <laughs> historic okay. context, you know, anything great that has come out of Chinese cuisine, we can really claim. Um, <laughs> and, okay, know, the battle of and, the titans here. And it boba is was started in uh, Taizong, uh, called, in a place called Chun Shui Tang. There's actually a lawsuit going on um, between two boba tea parlors. There's Chun Shui Tang, which claims and is widely known as the inventor of bubble tea in Taizong. And there's a shop a few blocks down that nobody knows the name of is trying to sue Chun Shui Tang because they're like, we invented it and you just stole it. But yeah, you know, nothing like a little boba drama. Yeah, absolutely. So, wow, we're just about at time, you know, at the, the clock, it's just about 8.30. I sort of feel like we haven't done either of these places justice in terms of kind of the, you know, describing some of the real high-end, you know, exciting cuisine that's coming out. And Lucas, we haven't talked about dim sum. So we're gonna have to bring you guys back, okay? That's sure, sure if you're willing. Um, but I just wanna thank you both so much. I mean, the, 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 there have been tons of comments uh, as you've been speaking from people just saying, this is an amazing conversation. You are both chefs, but you're also historians and cultural ambassadors. So, oh. <laughs> and, and, you know, we've really taken a sort of gone on a, an amazing, crazy tour of history through food. And uh, thank you so, so much. Now we just are all dying. We're all hungry. We're all dying to go. And hopefully we can all jump on airplanes and go and, you know, taste the real thing. But in the meantime, we can all go to 886. Um, here in New York, uh, and we can certainly go to Junza Kitchen as well. And Lucas, you're opening a new restaurant as well. Yeah, we just opened a nice day here in Bleecker, so come check us out. Um, nice day is our take on American Chinese food. The food is, we just did a new menu launch that we're quite excited about, a lot of Hong Kong influence. Um, right. And How we're about to open in Long Island. It's what nice were you saying, time. Eric? I know he has a Taiwanese ice cream on his menu, and I just need to remind him every time he talks about nice day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, this conversation about Taiwan and Hong Kong will continue, and we're going to bring the Shy Boys Club back to our audience. But thank you so, so much for joining. Thank you to the audience. Please join as members. You know, your membership really means that we can, it helps us bring wonderful programs like this um, to the China Institute stage. So thank you all for joining. Can't wait to talk to you guys again soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.